Lexcon Crypto. We're just getting the vibe going uh, today. We've got an exciting uh, interview for you folks today. Uh, one of the leaders in uh, the industry today. Super stoked. We've we've been uh, working on uh, scheduling here for, uh, I don't know, maybe it's been two months or something. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, super stoked to finally <laughs> be able to connect and uh, get us on the line. Today, uh, as a guest in our virtual studio, we have the CEO and co-founder of Bitwave, Pat White. Pat, thanks for joining us. It is my absolute pleasure. Yeah, Andrew, I was getting worried about you. You're like, all right, there's, you know, high winds, our internet's out, power's out. Like, oh man, you know, where you are in the world is, uh, it's, it gets, gets hit. <laughs> it was, we were, uh, I, I don't know what it was. There was maybe like some, you know, some bad karma in the air or something, but it was like every time <laughs> right, right as we go to this call, I was like, man, this guy's just going to end up like killing me or something. I don't know what's going on, but no, I appreciate your patience. Oh, good. And, this uh, stuff is hard. Under, understanding. Yeah. So, yeah. I was super stoked. So, hey, let's let's just jump um, right right into the into some of the the meat of some of these things. You, know, you were explaining a little bit to me, you know, prior to the call um, that that you would think of Bitwave as a uh, infrastructure uh, play into the into the crypto industry, and and you guys have a very interesting role, sort of sitting in between uh, entities and and you know they're in collecting data understanding sort of the, the, the role in the space in the market. Would you mind just giving us just a little bit of, a, of an intro to a Bitwave and the role that you guys play in the industry? Absolutely. So Bitwave, just really, really quickly, Bitwave is a digital asset finance and accounting platform. Like basically what we are is a uh, digital asset um, subledger for your accounting needs, accounting and tax needs for cryptocurrency. So if you use, I always like to give this example. Like, let's say I'm going to pay you. No money changed hands for this interview. Don't worry. But let's say I'm going to pay you one Bitcoin to be on this show today. When I do that, I basically create four different obligations for me as a business, for Bitwave as a business. We create the obligation to account for that. So I just gave you $18,000 worth of, $70,000 worth of, of money that was was coins that we own that I'm now sending to you. So that's a, I need to book that into my into QuickBooks or, or NetSuite or whatever I'm using. Um, second of all, I just relieved, I had Bitcoin in my inventory and I just sold it for that 17000 The delta between where I bought it, where I sold it is, of course, my, my taxable gain. I might have a separate accounting gain loss because of the way accounting rules work, you sometimes right. end up having a different cost basis for accounting purposes than for tax purposes. And then I also might need to send you a 1099. Like I might need to send you a 1099 miss because I sent you $20,000. In the US, you, gotta, you have to do that for cl- compliance purposes. So basically, right. when, you, when you're doing anything with crypto, you end up picking up all these obligations as a business, and we have a sort of a full software suite to help you with all of that. Um, one of the, the fun ways, I, that, that's kind of where we are now, where, where we started, and, and, and honestly, where we're going, if you ask anyone they, they should tell you the exact same thing about our, our vision, which is that we are here to enable digital assets for businesses and enterprises. So if I, I always like to think about this in terms of like Coinbase is out there trying to get the next million retail users onto crypto. MetaMask, trying to get the next million retail users into DeFi. Um, that is that is noble. That is great. We need that to be happening. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get the next, the next 10,000 you know, businesses uh, into crypto. So we're trying to get all the Fortune 500s into, into digital assets, all the Fortune 2000, everyone in, in public, you know, companies across the world. Like we focus on how do we enable enterprise with digital assets Day one, that's tax and accounting, but day two, it's you know complex financial financial operations, monitoring data warehouses, you know even even getting into interesting stuff about like what does what does it look like you know you and me when we when we mess around with you know Uniswap or something like that, we just go to their website, we we mess around with it. But if you're if you're a, a, an enterprise spending a uh, hundred million dollars, you can, you're not just going to go to Uniswap.com and, and and like do that right from there. So even like think about how how are businesses and enterprises going to engage with these dApps down the line? Right, right. No, for sure. Now, I, I know you know as 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 entrepreneurs, we we are almost all the time right trying to come up with ideas or looking and seeing opportunities. And you know, Web three has over the last several years been just a, a gold mine of of you know entrepreneurial just like overload. So many opportunities, so many ideas, so many things. A lot of times those those are narrowed down by your background, experience, 
is 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 that something that played into you know the founding of of Bitwave for you and for Amy? Hundred percent, hundred percent. So we uh, basically, my co-founder and I are both enterprise software people. So I I've been in crypto forever. I got into crypto. I have some code contributed to the Bitcoin Core node from like 2010. I did some work on their RPC, their RPC yep. stack and stuff like that. Um, I've been in crypto forever, but in 2010 there wasn't enterprise. Like my entire career has been enterprise software. So right, I worked right. from Microsoft, Cisco, into it. Like I was an, I was a business software person. In 2010, there wasn't business software in crypto. You know, like there weren't real businesses. There, the 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 most that like, I almost decided to you know to do like a custodian because custodians were kind of uh, businessy. Okay. But like I don't know if you know, you're, I mean you were around. Like remember the time like when Zapp, Zappo came out and they yeah. had a freaking bunker in Switzerland and had dudes with guns and airlines yes. and like yes. that's not a like. It's that's an interesting business, but that's not like a fun business, right? That's right. an operational security business. That's a, a Blackstone, like guys with guns business. That's not a cerebral yeah. building software kind of business. <laughs> right. So, right, right. Um, and I like to, I got, I, you know, I spent a lot of my life trying not to be around a lot of people with guns. So I'm like, exactly. I don't know how I do that. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, I, so we set it aside uh, from 2010. And then, you know, I, we start my, my co founder and I started another business in the uh, enterprise search space in that case. And then basically, you know, we sold that company and then, and then uh, we came back into the market in 2017. And there were finally real businesses, you know, that's when yeah. Chainlink had launched. They had directors yep. and they had uh, a corporate location. And there was, you know, the uh, Galaxy and Nidig and all of these companies. There's real companies out there. They, right. they weren't just avatars and GitHub, they were real businesses. So my, right. my co founder and I sat down. And we just we put together a PowerPoint that just said, what problems will businesses have with digital assets? And we listed like 20 or 30 things. Uh, and some of those were like, it was very jaded by the time. Like some of them were like, you know, Bitcoin multi-sig. Like how do you do Bitcoin multi-sig transactions? Because it was really hard. I mean, it yeah. still is pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. if, you, yeah. if you have like three people self-custody, it still is kind of a pain to do a Bitcoin self uh, uh, multi-sig transaction. Right. Um, right. But but then the the thing that float, floated to the top was accounting and tax. That okay. we ended up getting our first customer in 2018, and now four years four years later, we're you know we, we have a very unique place in the market where we, we have this very unique product that that works for the biggest companies. We have 15 to 20 different public companies using our product at this point, uh, and it's just really fun. It's been a really fun journey. Yeah. No, it's amazing. Now you guys also have uh, just recently broke uh, broke some news and. Uh, Making you even more unique in the space, uh, you've actually uh, successfully closed around in the winter. And I looked at your uh, careers page, and it looks like there's a ton of activity over there. I mean, that's that's pretty exciting to be able to uh, to, to make those announcements and to be able to see we're, that growth. We're hiring. We're yeah. if, if if you're out there and you're looking for work in the crypto space, we're hiring. There's uh, we have more more work than we can ever do. You know, crypto accounting is kind of nice because it is counter cyclical. It's just that whether whether you whether it's going up or down, you kind of need to know your position. You know how much money you're making or losing. Like there's this counter cyclical nature to it that's super important. So that's been really nice. But we're also we're relatively disciplined. You know, uh, Amy and I we bootstrapped <clears throat> the company for the first three years. Uh, we took our first funding in 2021, grew the team. You know, we're we've always been kind of uh, striking distance of profitability, uh, and that's it's sort of like in our in our blood a little bit is to is to be like that. You know. I, I'll tell you, like, to, to get a little more philosophical about this, like, uh, I've been in startups for, for my entire career. Like, I love startups. That's what I, since I was a little kid, that's the only thing I ever wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. And, like, when you see someone like like uh, FTX raise, you know, raise a $32 billion valuation, there's just issues with that. Like, it's a three-year-old company worth $32 billion. There are just problems that are going to happen. I mean, like, you yeah. pay to do, to have a $32 billion valuation, um, Maybe, maybe someone will give you that valuation when you have a hundred million dollars revenue for a little bit of time. But like, you have to grow into valuations. Like, you don't get to raise your next round. If you raise a hundred million dollar valuation here, if you raise at a hundred million dollar revenue valuation here, you don't get to raise at a at a billion dollar valuation the next time. So all right. these companies who are raising just exorbitantly sized rounds on kind of like okay, okay, revenue, you know, good good growth acceleration. There was always going to be issues with that. I mean, it just it was inevitable that there was it was not sustainable, and like everyone could see it. Everyone in the crypt, everyone in like the BC world could see it, except for 
except for the, the, the VCs are investing in crypto, which was super uh, interesting. So, you know, for us, we, we were, we took a very pragmatic stance on all this stuff and kind of go, go with a, you know, growth, growth, but, you know, reasonable readiness and probability right. approach right. to all these things. Right. No, I mean, I think that's, you know, those are the, 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 the companies that um, aren't just uh, the avatars on GitHub, as you mentioned, the companies that aren't just, um, you know, backed by some uh, network of, you know, bros and, uh, you know, connected, connected politically and are able to raise crazy money for no reason. Um, you know, I think those are those those companies through the winter here, we're going to see phase out. Um, as, yeah. as you know, I mean, even this week, there's been a lot of, of noise about several of more larger companies that are, um, you know, t- t- tied perhaps in, into that space. So, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, companies, I, I think, are going to be going going away. And yeah, while layoffs. It, and yeah, it's it, yeah. yeah. And it, in the short ter- term, it's obviously terrible. But, you know, I think if we're looking long term at the industry where I'm sure you guys plan to be and exist, uh, I think it's actually a good thing because it it reinforces the case for software exactly like what you guys are building, and and the real serious companies, the ones who are going to be here in in ten years and are going to actually underpin the, the the foundation of this industry as it as it continues to expand and roll forward inevitably, is is going to be solutions like what like what you guys are building. Well, what I, what I like to talk about is that the the winters are great because. <laughs> the noise starts to filter out. Like I like I like NFTs. I own some NFTs. Like I, I like NFTs. But at the end of the day, like there is a noise aspect to NFTs of like we are it's it's very much like a you know, I always compare NFTs to Supreme, the brand, which yeah. is like it's, it's a, you know, NFTs are a form of in crowd engagement for either brands or you know whatever it is for people. So if I if I have a board ape and I tweet with my board ape, people know, oh, this is this guy is serious about crypto. I don't yeah. have that, but that's like if, if you do that, it's is, is this in 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 crowd signaling effort essentially. Yes. Um, but when when you start to get out of that noise, the the stuff that's terrible about this is is crypto is not about speculation. Like the the idea of the FTT token, we're gonna you're bag on FTX a little bit because they're an easy punching bag. The idea of the FTT token being worth uh, thirty two dollars or whatever was it five billion dollar market cap is for for essentially a loyalty program is insane, right? Like it is categorically insane in the history of business to have a loyalty rewards program that people are trading at that kind of market cap. Right. And so the, the winter tends to wash those things out because with the FTT token, you had speculative upside buyers, but you never had value downside buyers, right? So like, if you look at something like Tesla, we could all be mad at Tesla right now or not, whatever, however you feel about this stuff. But like, there is a, there is a downside buyer there is a floor for Tesla's price because they have revenue, they have X, Y, Z things. Someone is in there doing a, a value-driven investing decision about Tesla that as much negative pressure is, there will be a floor for that price. Something like FTT, there is no negative, there is no value argument to be made about that token. And so it washing out entirely on the ecosystem is great. Where we talked about is, you know, if you think about Walmart, Microsoft, Nike, these guys getting into crypto, they're not getting into crypto uh, to speculate, like Walmart, when Walmart finally gets into crypto, I have no inside information here, so this is not privilege or anything. Right. When Walmart gets into crypto, it's not going to be because one of their their, their CFO is like, "Dude, we're going to buy some Bitcoin. Let's go after the Federal Reserve." Like, no, Walmart right. needs the Federal Reserve. They are they, they like right. the Federal Reserve. Um, when they get into crypto, it'll be because Walmart pays probably I don't know a million to two million bills a month, something like that, and they probably pay hundreds of like like millions of dollars to do that and if they could do that all on polygon for like i don't know 15 dollars in fees like they're gonna see that and say oh there's a marginal efficiency story to be had here or if yes. they can look at like their supply chain and say hey i'm gonna have it so when i scan a container coming to our to our warehouse it releases payments all the way down the line uh and just changes the nature of that that like, they're only gonna marginal efficiencies and so when you when you get rid of that speculative noise that, that we are used to during the non-winters, uh, enterprises actually are in a really good place to say, oh, you know, there's actually some relationship stuff here that we can do around making our processes smoother, you know, getting our marginal efficiencies down, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, and, and you know, we see, we, we see that, that evidence in that because, 
even though we've gone through the winter and even though we're, you know, people are, you know, hibernating and, uh, you know, whales are hiding and uh, whatever, all the other terms <laughs> that we want to use. Um, the, the reality is that institutions continue to move forward. And, you know, whether it's a, whether you're a financial institution, um, whether you're, you know, a, a corporation, I mean, you've mentioned Nike and, and Walmart and these others, everyone, every single publicly traded company today, every Fortune 500 company has some uh, research and development or some programs already in implementation around, you know, leveraging blockchain and, and de facto crypto. And so, you, yep, you, know, you, you know, that that's that's rolling forward. And what what I think a lot of the noise is is the speculative retail investor, you know, and and sure they're yep. they're they're fueled by whales and they're fueled by these you know also by I think by influencers creating narratives that that perhaps are, aren't real or or being paid to do them, and that seems to be where the noise, you know, is is being captured by politicians today. So, you know, the Washington, although, you know, SEC and the CFTC, I think they've taken, you know, a, a few actions here or there. For eight years, the SEC has claimed that they have uh, regulatory oversight uh, on, on crypto. And yet, really, the, the action has been very little. And uh, even, even now, in response to FTX, you know, the, the, the most that we have seen right now is just in the last couple of days, some actual charges pressed. Uh, around wire fraud or something like that, but you, you wonder, you know, where is the where is the action that that needs to be taken uh, from from a regulatory perspective? Yeah, it's so interesting to me because I I think that we are in a really interesting. Um, it, it, it's so interesting to me because we do have you know in America in particular. We do always have these two competing tensions of of kind of like liberty and safety for consumers. Like that is a very natural – that's a very totally. natural tension that we have in America. That goes for things like guns. That goes for things like, you know, self – self uh, uh, you know, what you're doing with your own money and investing in things. And, and crypto certainly falls into that. So we've, sure. what we've done with, with crypto is we've, we've <laughs> somehow managed to back ourselves into kind of the worst corner, which is we've we've – in a deadlock, abstain from any sort of comment or regulation. Regulation on this stuff wouldn't be bad. Like there is a world where where regulatory pressure could have had uh, could have changed how FTX worked. Like we might have been able to avoid it with regulation. I don't think so. Like regulation doesn't help with fraud. You know that regulation helps with people who are trying to do the right thing, not the not right. the wrong thing. Right. Um, but there is like there's this unnecessary burden that we all. You know, a, a great example that I'll give you, which is just, it's so silly, but it's just something that like, why isn't someone just say something? I know no one wants to say anything, but this is something that happens in our world. It is not at all clear today, seven years since its development, six years maybe, whether or not when I go from Ethereum to Weave, whether or not that's a taxable transaction. Exactly. That, that is not, that is not defined by anybody. Exactly. And to me, I, you know, I, I guess I'm probably, if you really put me somewhere on a spectrum, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of regulation, but like, that's such a stupid one that would make everyone's life so much better. Why are you making every single, it's, it's, there's it almost like this waste of time, like uh part yeah. instead of one statement from the IRS saying that is a taxable event or that's not taxable. You instead take the, you know, whatever it is, the 10 million people that are in crypto and you make each of them spend five minutes thinking about that. You've now spent whatever fifty million minutes trying to make a decision about ETH to ETH, rather than seven seconds that the IRS could have released something. And that's that's the kind of stuff that I get I get really kind of annoyed about in the space. Is it's very penny wise, pound foolish. Like they yeah. don't want to say anything because they don't understand it. But at the end of the day, the IRS is always changing their mind on stuff. That's nothing new. So like, why aren't we? Why aren't we uh, just? Making statements and then iterating on those those statements. So that's my that's my my soapbox. <laughs> right. No. 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 I, and I I totally agree. So I I come from this perspective. I'm I'm definitely on the libertarian side, um, but I believe in free markets. And and I know that that you know while free markets in the uh, in the ideal world of Ayn Rand could be uh, self would be self regulated. Um, th that's not the reality in which we live. And so there needs to be regulation in order to 
um, for the for the fluid functioning of free markets. And so I believe in as little regulation as possible to to facilitate that. And and while I've appreciated you know the 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 ability for the crypto industry to be able to grow and blossom in the way that it has, I also think that like you had said. It, even just a little bit of of regulation, maybe not would have, maybe it would not have um, avoided the happening of FTX, but but it certainly could have mitigated the uh, the extent of the damage. Um, you know, I, I I think it would have had a limiting effect in in how significant that that was. But you know, I mean, the, if we talk about FTX, the, the part of the problem there is they knew the game and they knew that they needed to donate to politicians, and if they did that. Well. They they could and get like past the like, things. The, the thing that kills me about FTX, which I, this is this is my, my hill, and I'm going to die on this on this like little tiny mole, mole hill, is that FTX like FTX started fundamentally. So so SPF was out there arming. You know, he was using his network to arm into the into the uh, um, the Korean markets and getting good good uh, good experience from that. He started FTX because he wasn't happy with the instruments, the financial instruments that he had access to for Bitcoin and Ethereum, like for crypto. So, you know, there's there's some simple option stuff floating around out there, but he didn't have access to perps and weird right. derivatives and weird butterfly hedges and like automatically triggering all this blah, 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 blah. So he, you know, he as a Jane trader, he was a Jane Street trader. So from Wall Street, looked at crypto and he didn't say like, what are all the cool things that decentralization can do? What are all the cool things that crypto can do? How, how's the world changed? He didn't look at any of that. He said, how can I like bring these instruments that I was used to at Jane Street into crypto so that I can make money, more money trading on it? And if there's, if there's one thing that I do not, that I literally, I, I do not, uh, I will never forgive him for, it's that. Because that was never, like we never should have been bringing weird exotic instruments in. Like at some point, Goldman would have gotten into crypto and they would have had the exotic instruments. You know, we should have been focusing on what are, what are new decentralized ways to build exchanges? What are new ways to do self custody? Like, there's all this great stuff to look at. And he came in with a traditional finance perspective. And I, and I kind of expand that a little bit to the VCs that invested in him because VCs investing in him, you know, you squint your eyes, you look at a company like Bitway, and it's kind of a, you know, it's like, well, what, why, why does crypto need accounting software? We already have accounting software. It's, it's like really, like, you're, you're going over this, like, you're going over this, this, this uh, uh, you have to like get through that from the perception standpoint. But you squint your eyes, you look at FTX, and they're like, oh yeah, this is just TD Ameritrade for crypto. I get it. Like, let me give it. Where do I write my big check? And so it's like you know, if you think about VCs predominantly as finance people, which most of them are, like we're lucky that most of our VCs are not hardcore finance right. people. They are like crypto people and stuff like that. But yeah, most yeah. VCs have a finance background. So when you when you've got something that like looks and smells like finance. You're like, yeah, I get this. I, I know the market. I understand how the margins work. I get how it all works. I like it. Give me a huge, a huge check there. But it's not. That's not crypto. That's not why we're all here. And in fact, yeah. it's very antithetical because, by its very definition, a perp is a paper Bitcoin. Like by its definition, perps are derivatives that are not backed. Right. So, right. <laughs> it's just... Right. No. It, it, and that and that sort of is the. Uh... I mean, I, I think that's the way history is going to going to review this whole incident is the is the idea that, you know, FTX essentially brought the worst of the financial markets <laughs> into the industry <laughs> that was created to destroy those things. And, and like, exactly. th that that's sort of that's sort of I, I think will be the, the view. Now, let me just add, but before we before we get totally derailed in the in the uh, the FTX FBF conversation. So. Um, you know, I, I kind of have a have a theory that that his his angle on uh, trying to uh, dethrone Binance was to create his own um, crypto bill, and in order to get a bill passed, he had to pay politicians seventy million dollars, and and to be able to do that, do, do you think that that there's this these rumors of FTX and Binance being at being at total odds and having a war and you know all of these things that, that he's <laughs> perhaps alluded to is that. Is that accurate from your estimation, or is this just sort of a made-up drama? Um, you know, I, I don't really know, to be honest, and I haven't followed it too closely. The part that I've followed closely is the, it's, the thing that I've, I've enjoyed is not the right word, but the thing that was most interesting to me about this entire fiasco was that uh, SBF gave CZ the, the gun that eventually 
shot him, right? Like when when F, when SPF wanted to back out of the Binance investment and they bought out of that with FTT tokens, um, essentially like they should have realized at that point that uh, that they were basically arming their competitor to to take them down to future at a future level. And I will give CZ a lot of credit for for also rec- realizing that when he did and executing it when he did. Like it was, it was a masterstroke of strategy. I don't know what else to yeah. say. Like, I don't think yeah. it was good for the crypto industry. Like, maybe it was, maybe what? Like, all that set right. aside, the idea that he, the Alameda balance sheet came out, showed that they were overexposed to FTT. He had literally been sitting on these tokens for years at this point. He realized that because they're overexposed to it, and because of his holding, he could literally crash the price of it. He started down that path, caused a bank run, and then just imploded the entire company. Now, were there other issues? Of course, there were tons of other issues. But it was like I don't I can't think of a of a recent history memory of something as elegantly executed as that. Maybe the Terra the Terra um, teardown was also that elegant. But it was a incredibly elegant attack that that he himself uh, handed the ammunition over to Steezy to do. Right. So that's, that's right. my takeaway. I, there's there's I do I don't I do think that that a company you know companies are not ideological. Companies are self sustaining. So if you are a business and you are a centralized exchange. Then a self-sustaining, a one method for self-sustaining is to make decentralized exchanges illegal. So I I don't necessarily think that he was malicious or like you know Mr. Monty Burns like you know sure, uh, sure. Uh, 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 you know but I do think that that the natural progression if you are if you are putting together a legislative agenda and you want to maximize the value of your company as a centralized exchange, one way to do that would be to destroy DeFi. Yeah, and so I think yeah. that he might have. There was probably some some misaligned incentives between him and crypto in general. Right on, right on. So so let me let me ask you. We're, we've got about uh, three or four minutes left. If you're uh, if you're willing to to hang on here, let's do the it. Next, I love it. This the, is the next, <laughs> this the is so next, much fun, man. I love. I I mean, I appreciate that. I love this stuff. So the next six to twelve months for 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 Bitwave and for the for the crypto industry. What is that? What does that look like if you're looking into your crystal ball? <clears throat> um, you know, I like to think about crypto in terms of the summer of, to, you know, like 2020 was the summer of DeFi, 2021 was the summer of NFTs, 2022 was the summer of, of winter, <laughs> you know, it was the summer of, of uh, crashes. Um, I think 23 is going to be the, the summer of tokenization. I think we're finally seeing some really cool movement on the tokenization front. So I think we're finally going to get to the point where every single, um, you know, every single asset can be bought or sold. So Tesla stock, Microsoft stock. All that will be purchasable on blockchain. Um, we're seeing amazing stuff from the real estate companies, Realty and uh, and uh, yes. uh, Roofstock and all those guys. Um, I think the 2020, 2023 is going to be all about that. I also think it's going to be the 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 year for us. Like I'm I'm very much looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a year of um, marginal. I think we're seeing more and more businesses get into it. There's a lot of stuff really that has actually aligned very well for enterprises getting into crypto. And I know this is this is kind of a silly way to look at it, but like. At the end of the day, you know, if you think about a business, they have product requirements, they have board requirements, they have their, their treasury CFO requirements. All of those have to align to do something, whatever it is you want to do. You want to buy a baseball stadium, like you have to get approval from those those three people, like you know, mm-hmm. product marketing and all that. So, so the you know, there's been a lot of interest from enterprises on the product side, but it's been very, very difficult to get board buy-in and CFO buy-in into crypto from enterprises. And the reason is, for from a CFO perspective, the current accounting rules for crypto are you have to do this thing called impairment, where you mark your assets down, but you never get to mark them back up. So that yep. means that if I'm talking to Mr. CFO at Coca-Cola, I'm like, hey, you have $100 million of ETH on your balance sheet. A flash crash could mean that you, on some random quarter, have to take a $100 million loss on your P&L, and there's nothing you can do about it. Even if it comes right back up the next day, you're, you're so well. So FASB right. recently announced some rules changing that. That, or they're, they're announcing that they are going through the process of changing that. That means that finally your CFO can get a little bit more. It's it's still exposure to kind of the exotic asset, but they can get more comfortable because, you know, they're not going to randomly get a, get a, a dinged with $100 million losses on their own. Right, you know? right. And then from the board from the board perspective, I mean, honestly, the merge was great because, you know, whatever you think about this stuff, at the end of the day, there was a lot of bad press about the environmental impact of, of crypto in general. So the merge going from you know t- basically taking the impact of ETH down ninety nine point nine five percent means that if I'm going to my ESG subcommittee on my board, 
I can say, hey, we can use Ethereum because it's not, it's, it aligns with our ESG, our ESG incentives. And so all of that stuff coming together means that I actually think we're really going to see great pickup from enterprises. And it would have been a lot faster if FTX hadn't happened. But it's still going to be a really good year for, for businesses and enterprises getting into this stuff. Awesome. No, I, that's it's a great insight. I I uh, agree with with all of the the sentiment, and uh, you know I, I love <laughs> being able to uh, bring a little bit of uh, positivity into uh, what, what has been uh, overwhelmingly negative. So I'm I'm super stoked about that, Pat. You have been uh, extremely generous uh, with your time. Uh, so excited for for you and for Bitwave. It's great to see um, you know good companies, good people. Uh, doing doing great things in in the space and um, very excited for you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to jump jump on the call here today and participate with us. I know our, our audience will uh, love it. So we just uh, want to say thank you. Appreciate that and uh, hope you have a, a great holidays and uh, and a happy new year. My absolute pleasure. This was really great, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me, buddy. Thanks, Pat. We'll talk to you soon. Alrighty, bye, everyone.